Hello, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to the PATH 11 podcast with your hosts, Mike and April. Today, we're speaking with Rebecca Kryzak, certified veterinarian acupuncturist. Rebecca actually happens to be Mike's sister, and we thought that this would be a great show to complement the past two shows that we had with Dr. Michael Wayne, who is an acupuncturist doing acupuncture on human beings, and then Bernie Siegel's interview when he was talking about animals and miracles and just had some wonderful stories about the healing energy of animals. And now we have Rebecca, who actually does acupuncture on animals as well. So we thought that that would be a nice combination. So welcome to our show, Rebecca. Thank you, April. It's it's really fun to be here. Awesome. So I didn't even know that you could do acupuncture on animals. So maybe you can kind of bring us back to what led you into wanting to be a veterinarian and then how you decided to blend acupuncture into your treatment. Sure. So I started out on, on the very traditional route I always wanted to be a veterinarian, loved animals, Um, I still love animals actually. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So I was trained in Western veterinary medicine at Kansas State University. When I graduated, I started my own practice doing house call veterinary work on all sorts of animals, so a mixed animal practice. And then I sort of narrowed that down to working on just small animals, dogs and cats and horses, mainly for lameness issues. And I got interested in acupuncture in particular because there were many cases where I felt I needed more. That I, you know, the Western medicine was getting me to a certain point and I just needed to take it another level with many of my patients. And um, actually I have a very personal story to what led me specifically to acupuncture with my own dog. She had had um, bilateral knee surgery. And surgery was very successful, but we did not get her to the point that I really wanted her to be. Uh, So I started looking into other avenues. We did physical therapy for eight weeks after the surgery, and um, she was healing fine, but she wasn't to 100% by any means. So I started looking around. I saw that veterinary acupuncture was actually a growing field within veterinary medicine. So I that led me to the Chi Institute in Florida, um, where Dr. Shea, who is a world-renowned veterinary acupuncturist, works. And he was actually one of the original veterinarians who basically made acupuncture mainstream in veterinary medicine. And he started a program at Florida State College of Veterinary Medicine, which was the first acupuncture program at a veterinary college. So in veterinary medicine, it's it's actually much more mainstream, I think, than human medicine, whereas you have westernly trained veterinarians actually doing acupuncture too, which is unique in that it's a very popular avenue right now. So with my own dog, I went through the training at the Chi Institute, um, which is a pretty intense program, and then I became certified in veterinary acupuncture. Um, and I actually took many courses in herbal medicine as well. So Chinese herbal medicine and food therapy. And then I started applying it to my patients, obviously, and I was working on my own dog. She has done so much better with acupuncture too. She gets it regularly. Um, so it, it just helped round her out a little bit more and she she's much more functional. So that obviously was was beneficial that way. So and now I'm using it on, you know, my patients and I still do the house calls. So I go into people's homes. I still do regular Western medicine too. So what I call what I do is actually integrated medicine. So I combine the veterinary acupuncture, some of the traditional Chinese veterinary medicine with herbal medicine and the food therapy and than your regular Western medicine too, which is a unique approach. Not everyone is doing it that way, but I feel as though with the integrative medicine, we get the best of both worlds because they both have a lot to offer and they both complement each other. And it's just basically, it's making it the outcomes more than the sum of the parts we're putting in basically when we integrate them and use them together. Can you describe that surgery that your dog went through? I I know what you're talking about, but I don't, just for the listeners to know. Sure. So Brie is my dog. She's a golden retriever. She tore, basically it's the equivalent of our ACL. So in both knees, running around like a maniac. So (laughs) 
Um, we couldn't do the surgery right away for her. It's a very expensive and intense surgery, uh, especially to do both knees. Um, so, and there's a very long recovery period for that for the dogs where they have to be very restricted for a long time. But basically what is done, what we had done was called a, a tibial tuberosity advancement, TTA. A lot of people are getting TPLOs done on their dogs with the same for the same condition. We went with the TTAs because then we could do both knees at the same time. And what is going on is we're actually fracturing a part of the tibia and then replating it and angling it just slightly differently so that the dogs don't need that ligament anymore, basically, because we're not replacing the ligament and we can't do a total knee replacement on the dogs yet. So that was the basic surgery. So it's a pretty intense surgery. It's basically fracturing a main weight-bearing bone and then replating it. So, <laughs> and so what was what was your dog's recovery like? So your dog got some acupuncture before the surgery because the surgery was, you know, you guys probably were saving money and it was expensive. And she did not get the acupuncture before because I wasn't actually very open to it. I didn't know a lot about it. So beforehand, I had, I mean, she did that when I was in veterinary school. And so and you go to a Western veterinary college and it's very, okay, we only do things that are <laughs> scientifically proven um, and nothing else. And so we don't learn a lot about that in the Western schools. Florida is a, a unique school where they have an actual program that's slightly separate from the main veterinary program. So not all veterinarians are learning acupuncture at this point in time at the schools. And it's still at the colleges of veterinary medicine. It's, it's still not completely accepted. So I was in that, that arena when she actually injured herself. So I never even thought of it as an option, to be honest with you. And, you know, I knew the surgeon very well. And so we went that route. And so she had no acupuncture beforehand. Right afterwards, I immediately put her in a physical therapy program. So in the physical therapy program, she was doing things like underwater treadmill, um, therapeutic ultrasound, uh, TENS, plus the heat and ice and passive range of motion exercises, things like that. So we were able to build up her muscle mass again, too. She had had a lot of atrophy as well. And that was an eight week physical therapy program. And then we slowly got her back to normal activity after that. And that it was after the eight weeks of physical therapy, I was just like, okay, she's not where we need her to be. What else is out here? There has to be something else for these animals. And then I was seeing it so much in my patients too, where we get to a certain point and I'm I just want to be able to give them something else, especially the older animals who may not be able to go through a surgery um, or if there are financial constraints for the owners, it'd be nice to at least be able to offer something for pain relief that's not very invasive, things like that. Now, I'm familiar with the human energy body system of meridians and things of that sort and where the acupuncturist will actually place the needles. Now, are animals energy meridians the same as humans or are they different? They're very similar with just a few differences. So the meridians are all the same. The organ systems with the five element theory, that's all the same. So we And we do the same types of diagnosis as far as the tongue and pulse diagnosis. I don't know if um, you guys talked about that in your other interview with the human acupuncturist. We did, but not totally in depth. So if you want to go into that. that sure. Would be good. So basically, um, acupuncture is very old, obviously. So the traditional Chinese uh, veterinary medicine in ancient China, so we're going back over 2,500 years ago, they would look at the environment um, and try to manipulate the environment, basically, and explain everything with what they were observing in their universe. So that's when they um, were looking at how there seemed to be a universal law of opposites, and we had to try to balance the opposites. There's daylight, there's nighttime, sun, moon, male, female, and that's the yin and yang. And then there's also, they were also looking at the seasons and how in the there's wood and there's earth and there's metal and uh, fire and water, and those are our five element systems. So then 
um, when they were starting to do their more medical practice, they were then taking those observations and applying it to the human bodies or animal bodies. In ancient China, they weren't doing this on animals. Um, they, this was purely a human procedure, basically. So then they took the five elements that they were observing in, in their universe and they applied it to the organ systems in the body. So now there's an organ system, basically, for each element. So the fire is heart, small intestine, water is kidneys, bones. So those elements govern areas of the human body. And they also relate that to the seasons, which is interesting too. So there are certain organ disease that may manifest more or be predisposed in certain seasons, things like that. And then our constitutions or our personalities, which partially, if you look connected to Western medicine, could be part of our genetics, are also related to the five element theory too. So you can place yourself and your personality into a five element to find your constitution. And we do the same thing with animals. So their meridians and channels are pretty much the same. They have the same organ systems. The, um, the acupuncture points, most of them were inferred from human, so comparative anatomy of humans, basically. So it does get a little tricky because there are there are obvious differences. So especially in, in horses where their their limbs are almost completely different. Or birds, that's a fun one too. <laughs> There's a definitely comparative anatomy that we're looking at to try to infer where those points would be on them. Um, and then there's also classical points where these are points that have been well studied in just a certain species that are found, they're kind of off the major meridians and it's just has been studied that, okay, this point is good for certain conditions in, in this species, in this location. So those have been studied too. So there are some separate points. Um, there are many more acupuncture points in humans, so there's not nearly as many in, in the dogs and cats, um, and that's partially because we have less classical points for the animals. We'll, we're constantly finding new acupuncture points for animals, though, so it is growing. They In China, they actually weren't doing it on dogs and cats. Um, those are, were not really domestic animals that they were doing medicine on for a long time. So it was production animals. It was for their their food animal groups and the animals that they were raising and horses in particular. So that's where it actually started in China and animals. And actually the United States is a little bit further along with the veterinary acupuncture than they are in China because they're just not, you know, it's more just a human emphasis there just for cultural differences. Okay. And, um, I'm sure our listeners are thinking, how do you get an animal to be still enough to place needles in? And I'm also curious to know what animals you've worked on besides maybe cats and dogs. So animals are fun. <laughs> They're constantly teaching us new things. So I'm always learning new techniques to try to get the animals to be still. Um, in general, animals love it. They absolutely love it. So the first sessions are usually the most difficult because there are sensations that come along when I place the needles. They're not usually painful sensations, but it's it's a unique sensation that the animals aren't used to, so they get a little weirded out sometimes. After that first session, almost all of my patients are they're ready for the next. They they love it. They and they'll go on to I go into the people's home, so the dogs will just go over to their dog bed and lay down and wait and and they're fine with it most most of the time. So as for all of the animals, believe it or not, I think cats are the easiest to acupuncture. Cats are, they're just unique creatures that they know what they want, they know what they like, and as long as they like it, they will, they'll go for it. So they overall, they seem to really enjoy the feelings that they're getting from acupuncture, and the cats generally don't need any restraint. I, they're sitting in a little, uh, like a fleece blanket, usually on an elevated surface. And after that first session, they'll, they will usually just sit there. My husband, Matt, has told me, he, he does come along on the calls with me often. He is my veterinary assistant and practice manager. 
his theory is he's not really a cat person. His theory <laughs> is that we're just getting a skewed population of cats who are actually getting acupuncture because those are the ones the owners are like, oh, we have to fix him no matter what because he's the best cat ever. Um, where maybe the more feral cats we, we wouldn't be getting anyway. So that's a possibility. The dogs... Again, generally, they really do like it. We've had a few dogs that once in a while I'll have a, a more aggressive dog. And the way I handle it is just, you know, going slow with them. I'll place a needle, let them regroup. I don't really push things. I don't sedate the animals to do this. And so, but generally it goes well. The puppies are also difficult because they, they just want to be moving and <laughs> and then they try to shake the needles out and the needles are flying everywhere. So we just try to do what we can with the animals, you know, and try to keep it a positive experience because usually we need more than one session. So we have to keep it as positive as possible. And then the horses, horses are a lot of fun to acupuncture. They generally enjoy it too. They're very easy. They, they're standing there and they don't mind, except a few of our performance horses who they're ultra sensitive where they, if, if I hit certain points in them, they will kind of buck and rear real quick and then they'll stop and enjoy the sensations. Interestingly enough, the most responsive animal to acupuncture that's been studied is actually cattle, <laughs> bovine. We're not doing it on them. Most um, producers, uh, we, we don't get to that level with them. It's just not something we do. But they, they are probably the most responsive species to acupuncture. Um, I haven't actually done it on bovine at all. I have worked on chickens doing acupuncture, and, and they don't they don't mind it either. They're, they usually enjoy it. That's the only odd species I've done acupuncture on. A turkey. I did do acupuncture on a turkey. And but. why do you think that is with the cows? Why are they the most responsive? What is, what's the theory behind that? Do you know? I don't know of any official theory. My theory is that they are very, if you've ever been around cattle, you know, when they're, when they're not stressed from human contact, they're very meditative herd animal when they're grazing it's a very meditative state and I don't know if they're just kind of always <laughs> like that and so when they're being needled that they're extra responsive I don't think I have a really great answer to that honestly so you mentioned that your husband Matt comes on calls with you and that he's working with you and was he actually into this whole acupuncture thing or what Matt was not he he's He's probably a skeptic in every sense of that word with everything. So he really needs to see the results to really believe anything, especially if it's not a very mainstream topic. So he was always supportive of me going to, um, you know, get further certification in acupuncture. That was never an issue, but he was always kind of, he called me the voodoo doctor for <laughs> a little while. And... He, he definitely was guarded about his opinion for a long time. And it, it was actually pretty funny because I would come home from my, my veterinary acupuncture classes and I didn't want to start working on my animals yet with the needles, so I would practice on Matt. <laughs> so he was my guinea pig. So he felt it firsthand too. So that helped. So he, he definitely felt there were sensations with it. I helped his back pain with it too, so that helped a lot. And then he goes on all of my calls with me, so he has seen the results firsthand. So now, so now he's he loves acupuncture. <laughs> and then when you say going on calls, are you primarily doing your acupuncture and your veterinary care in home? Primarily, I would say we're doing the house calls. Um, I do work at Parkside Veterinary Hospital in Albany one day a week doing acupuncture on their patients. So I am in the clinic one day a week. Okay, great. And I wanted to go back to, you mentioned something interesting about China using acupuncture with their animals for food production. So can you describe what type of food production you're referring to? Right. So in, with the food production, the way they would be using it would be um, mainly for breeding purposes. So also for meat purposes too, as far as producing, 
you know, feed to muscle mass ratios too. It's for performance, but they, they really, I guess I should have rephrased that anyways. It mainly was horses they were working on and that wasn't for food. They were doing acupuncture on cattle at a certain point. Now, Mike was mentioning um, off the air that you had some, you have some pretty incredible stories about putting animals to sleep and having to euthanize them, but maybe something happens during that process. I don't know. He didn't give me any <laughs> examples. I didn't, I haven't heard any stories yet. And I'm curious to know, um, what, what are your stories and what is sure. that about? So unfortunately, because I do house calls, I probably do more euthanasias than most veterinarians do in a clinic just because it is a nicer experience in the home. Um, so basically the process of it is very peaceful. I do um, sedate all of the animals first and until they're completely out of it. They're basically at a surgical plane of anesthesia. And then I use a euthanasia solution. And the euthanasia solution is very fast acting. So euthanasia, the roots of those that word is actually good death. And and that's, you know, what we're always striving for, you know, just to basically, you know, in those animals we know it's a chronic terminal illness, we're basically hitting the fast forward button for them just to skip the um, possible uncomfortable aspects of their disease. Um, so in those processes, I, I think, I, I don't know, I guess going back, the most amazing experiences have always been with the other animals in the house. They always know before we do what's going on. They always know when there is that release of the spirit from the body before I even have my stethoscope on them. The, the other animals know. And I'm going to bring up cats again <laughs> as those crazy little creatures because they, my again, my husband, Matt, he's not a cat person. Um, he calls them creepy. But <laughs> if there are cats in the house and we're euthanizing one of the other animals in the house, the, the cats come out and they are present almost always. They sit and they watch. And again, cats know what they like. They know what they don't like. They go towards what they like always. So if you live with cats, you probably see this. They're always on the most comfortable part of the bed. They're in the sun spots in the house. So to me, that's a sign that whatever is going on around the body at the time of release of, I call it spirit, it's something pleasant for those cats to be around. And whether they're feeling that vibrational change or transformation or something, um, they are feeling something for sure. Um, they're, I mean, they'll be sitting right next to us the whole time. And normally when I'm in a house doing regular veterinary work, the cats aren't around. <laughs> they know what I am and they, <laughs> they are under the couch or under the bed. They are not around. So to have that happen in almost every instance that we're euthanizing an animal and the cats are right there is, is unique. And they're not stressed about it. it. And it could be their buddy. Um, some of those cats, and sometimes it's cat, and we're euthanizing a dog in the house, and it was uh, the cat and dog had a very strong bond. Sometimes they don't, and the cats are still there. Again, Matt says they're creepy, grim reaper creatures, but I think that there's definitely more because they they definitely feel something positive because a cat wouldn't stick around if it wasn't positive. I guess the other aspects that I see um, during euthanasias are dogs in particular, when it's always a stressful process for an owner to decide when is the right time. And often we're having long conversations and very stressful conversations about it or a long time before the owners really decide to do the euthanasia. The whole process is also can be stressful to that the animal in question, especially the dogs. Um, dogs are so attached to us and owners that they're picking up everything, all that stress that the owner's going through trying to make the decision. They're picking up everything. Um, and I do think I see those dogs clinging 
to that. So as soon as the owners make that decision that they're going through with the euthanasia, there's already a release from those dogs usually. Um, we can, a visible relief. Sometimes the dogs even perk up and it starts to make the decision process go again. But there's definitely, you know, that that bond is, is so strong through that. That's always something, I mean, it's a really beautiful thing to watch too at the same time that they're, they're so in tune with us. Mike, when your dog Hank had some problem, I think it was with his knee, didn't Rebecca give him some acupuncture? Yeah, we, what, was it a torn ACL? Yep, he had a yeah. partial tear. Partial, yeah. Yeah, yeah the dog, we, he wouldn't climb stairs, he could barely walk, and he was limping around, and you, you did the acupuncture, and then you also did the laser therapy. Right. So I think I did, I think I did electroacupuncture on him too. So, and laser therapy. So, and I didn't go into that at all. Um, So electroacupuncture is something um, that's used in humans as well. And it's basically, the electro unit is basically a TENS unit. So it's providing trans electrical transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation. So normally a TENS is just on the surface of the skin in people. Um, What I'm doing with the electroacupuncture unit is I'm taking the leads and I'm hooking them up to the acupuncture needles that are in the acupuncture points. So the the electrical stimulation, it's just a mild electrical stimulation, is going into the acupuncture points themselves and stimulating it that way. Um, And that provides a longer lasting, deeper stimulation of the points. Um, It's any of you guys have ever had acupuncture, um, often um, the acupuncturist will kind of twist the needles periodically. It's the same principle as doing that and stimulating the acupuncture points, but we're using um, finer frequencies with the electricity, which we can't get by manipulating the needles with our hands. So it's it's provides almost immediate relief for things like muscle spasms, but it's also um, in general good pain relief. And then it's also just providing that deeper stimulation as acupuncture. Laser therapy is something that's becoming very mainstream in, in veterinary medicine. Almost every veterinary clinic has laser offers laser therapy now. Um, and what that's doing is basically using light energy to stimulate local areas of the body. So most veterinarians are using it, and this is just my terminology, I say the Western way, where <laughs> you're putting the laser probes over the, the affected areas and just using it that way. And it's basically increasing blood flow to that area, increasing the rate of healing, providing pain relief as well. And you do different frequencies, uh, possibly depending on the unit of um, with the light energy. What I also do with my laser unit is I laser acupuncture points. So then I'm stimulating acupuncture points with the light energy as well. And then you can also combine that with local using the probes over local areas too. In my theory though, you're also do you're also stimulating acupuncture points when you use it locally as well. So you're getting um, it's also providing a a nice stimulation. And I remember uh, you were telling me Mike that Hank really bounced back pretty quickly after he that had was the session. Within an hour of the session. Yeah. He, was, <laughs> <laughs> he was running around, jumping yeah. all over the furniture. Yeah. Yeah. And and you also, Mike was telling me a story about some of the work that you were doing, I think, after he told me what happened to Hank. And he mentioned something. He said, you know, my sister also believes or thinks that the le- the treatment will work if the owner believes in the treatment. Because animals are so receptive to this that they have, like, no judgment. They're not saying, like, oh, does acupuncture work? Or maybe it doesn't. I mean, animals will just take the energy and sit with it. But if the owner's belief um, if it has a strong belief, then you're also seeing because they're connected to the animal that the healing um, maybe is increased or the animal does better. Yes, absolutely. That plays such a huge role. And it's really interesting because when we're doing um, scientific veterinary research, technically there's no placebo effect if you really think about it because they don't know what that pill is 
what it's supposed to do. We still do controls in our studies when we're doing regular stu research studies to mimic them getting a pill, but technically they, there is no placebo with animals. However, <laughs> because they, domestic animals are so attached to owners and us, they are definitely affected by if an owner thinks something is positive or negative. And I see it all the time, even with Western medicines, if the owner's not on board with it, even if they're doing the treatments, the animal doesn't get the same response. So it, it, there definitely is a connection for sure. And maybe there is somewhat, maybe we could transfer a human placebo onto an animal. I don't, I don't know. I don't really know about that. But with acupuncture in particular, I see it because I often have clients who are owners that they, they come into this acupuncture appointment and they, they're not sure about it. They're only doing it because it's the only thing left for their animal. That's the only thing reason they're doing it. And they wouldn't do acupuncture on themselves, but they will do it for this animal. Um, so usually I will, you know, give my, my spiel and about what we're doing and I'm not getting a great response from the owner. They're like, Oh, I don't really care. Just do it. And we'll, we'll see. And those those owners are those owners are interesting because the in some situations, or actually the animals are interesting. I can see that the animal is just taking it all and taking it all in, all the energy manipulation. And the some of those animals are responding very quickly, like like Hank did. The owners see it, but they don't admit it. <laughs> they don't admit it right away. I have to really pull teeth to get them to say to say that, oh yeah, I guess I did see a result. But the next session, we get a bigger result. And the next session, we get an even greater result. And then the next thing I know, that owner is like, I had back pain, and I hate to admit this, but I went to an acupuncturist too. Um, and so the, it's changing their their lifestyle as well. And um, the same thing with, um, they do a lot of food therapy, and that's huge getting owners on board for that because it does require some home cooked diet sometimes. And a lot of owners come in and, and they're like, I, I don't have time to cook for myself. I'm, I don't think I can do any of this. And next thing you know, they're making meals for both themselves and, and their, their animal that they can all enjoy, which is interesting. And it's, it's making them have a healthier lifestyle as well. I did get off topic on that. <laughs> well, it kind of goes into, you know, asking a little bit more about the food nutrition and, you know, what you're recommending. And we haven't necessarily had anybody on. Well, we, yeah, we had one person on, Ladron, uh, talked about vegan nutrition. Mm -hmm. And um, we know how important it is just to fuel our own bodies. So mm -hmm. what type of nutrition do you educate your clients for their animals and what's important about uh, food nutrition for animals? Right. So a lot of it is similar to humans, except, you know, some of the, the mineral vitamin content has to be a little bit different. But overall, we want balance. Um, we want balanced nutrition. Um, and that's the main, the main thing I emphasize to owners. And you can get balance with commercial diets. It doesn't all have to be home cooked or anything like that. It does have to be geared towards the species. So sometimes a vegan diet may not be appropriate for a cat or <laughs> something like that. <laughs> because they are true carnivores. So you do have to still gear it towards the species. But overall, it needs to be balanced. So in a healthy animal who an owner just wants um, to maintain that health, it, we just emphasize you know, how to get that balance, whether they want a commercial diet or hook diet. What I do with the food therapy is a little bit different because that's taking a disease state or actually in Chinese medicine, it's just an imbalance. And then I'm using five element theory to gear their diets towards that. And it's almost like making it basically a, a dietary herbal, it's an herbal treatment almost. So we're, we're almost using herbs in our food as a, a dietary, daily dietary intake to adjust for imbalances. So they may not be on that diet long term. 
that's just a correct and imbalance. And then we'll go back to a completely balanced, just normal balanced diet after their imbalance in their body is corrected. So that that is a little bit different. It's not really like a animal nutritionist would be really, you know, measuring out all of the vitamins, minerals, making sure all that. And yes, we do that and try to maintain that healthy balance for the healthy animals. But once they're in a disease state and they're imbalanced, we still try to keep, we I keep the diets balanced. But short term, we're adding in other ingredients to, um, sometimes they are true herbs, sometimes they're just regular foods. But in Chinese medicine, food is actually herbs. Food and herbs are the same thing. That's They're constantly eating their herbal medicine, basically. So that's what that focus is with food therapy using five element theory. So, you know, something like I'll throw out a diagnosis in a dog, for instance, of a spleen chi deficiency. That would be an example of a, a diagnosis with five element theory. And then I would have to use certain types of foods that are safe for animals and balance that diet using those foods. For instance, sweet potatoes is a really good tone of fire of spleen chi. So possibly adding some sweet potatoes into their diet and there's also basically food therapy is also looking at energetics of food. So some foods are warming or more yang foods. Some are more cooling or more yin foods. So often our imbalances incorporate yin or yang deficiencies or excesses as well. So then we, I would tailor the energetics of the food to that too. And so if it was a a yin deficiency, I would add in more cooling foods. To that diet. So the spleen chi deficiency. So some people, when they hear that, now I'm a little familiar with it just because I've had acupuncture and that's usually my diagnosis is a spleen chi deficiency or whatever, because I sit a lot, you know, for work and, um, you know, need more movement and I'm very much in the brain. And so that's what some people have kind of described that (laughs) as, but for some people that sounds like a totally foreign language. So What, how do you describe that and what exactly does that mean? Right. So basically with the five element theory, they were again looking at the seasons and then and the other environmental elements. So they would start with springtime, which was the wood element. The wood element in with the organ system governs liver and gallbladder. And that doesn't just pertain to what we know of in Western medicine as the liver and gallbladder. So it also envelopes the entire liver meridian, the entire gallbladder meridian or channel um, that the acupuncture points are on. Um, but it also it is the liver system is uh, is a very... Um, it is the general. <laughs> it is a very angry organ system, basically. So anytime we have pain, there's usually some form of liver chi stagnation as well. So basically, the energy in the liver system is, is dammed up somewhere, which is contributing to the pain. So that's just one example um, for the liver chi stagnation, basically. But basically... If you move on to the next element, you would have fire. So fire is in the summertime. So it's a very young organ system too. So that is the heart and the small intestine. So again, the heart and small intestine, it's also pericardium as well, um, which has a lot of the same heart functions. And all of these are also meridians. And the, the heart organ system, again, it's going to envelope what we would consider heart functions, um, but it also has its own um, functions in in Chinese medicine too, which are, there's a myriad actually, (laughs) different things it's going to contribute to. So that's summertime. So after summer, we actually have late summer, and that's the earth, that's harvest time. So the earth governs the spleen, and that's digestion, and that fits with our harvest time as well when we're, we're eating. So the harvest time, um, digestion, so it's very a very laid back organ system, very calm, and basically the spleen system is everything with digestion. 
So it's not really our Western spleen at all, but it's also muscles. So if you have muscle atrophy, that's also a sign of spleen chi deficiency. So again, the chi flow is the energy flowing through the body. So in deficiency is just what it sounds like. So there's not enough. And that, that doesn't always mean there's not enough in the entire body. It's just there's not enough in that system and possibly because there is a dammed up area or stagnated area. And that's where acupuncture can really help relieve some of that and help it flow more smoothly through. So after spleen and earth in late summer, then we go into fall. Fall is metal. Metal in ancient times, the fall was a time after the harvest time where they were done with their wars and they were preparing for winter. So they were making weapons. So metal was, it was huge. Metal in um, the organ system is your lung and large intestine. So that, you know, govern, again, it's both the Western lung, some large intestine as well, and, and then the Chinese have their own uh, lung issues too, which a lot of our skin conditions actually would fall under that, um, or generalized skin conditions. You know, and then your general, a lot of allergies would, would fall into that, and some of our immune system functions also. So after fall, then we're going into winter. Winter is a time of hibernation, and you close in, but it's also the it's um, water element. The water element is actually a very, it's an inward element. So a lot of our deep organs, so your kidneys, your bones, and your bone marrow would be under that, and also um, spinal cord material could be under that. So the water element is interesting because it's a very, from the outward, perspective is very fearful, but water element is probably the most powerful element. And if you think about it, water can really destroy all the other elements. From veterinary medicine, I definitely see that because my water animals, my fearful animals, are the most powerful <laughs> animals. So it's definitely a, a powerful element, a force to be reckoned with, I guess. Um, and it's very tactical, so you may not see it coming. And then it goes back into wood. And there's other there's other cycles in that five element. So, for instance, I, I went in order of this, the normal circle that the Chinese use. So, you know, starting with, with springtime. So the wood feeds the fires. The fires burn down ash, which creates the earth. The earth is where the metal ores come from and then the metal holds the water so they and can control divert water so they um that cycle going in that order is like a mother child relationship so the the organ systems also relate to each other that way there's also other cycles from that. So if you go diagonal in that circle, so in, if you're drawing lines in a circle around the five elements, you make a, like a star figure. And if you follow those lines as from the star figure, so wood is going to earth, earth would go to water, water to fire. So water puts out fire. And then fire goes to, this is hard to do without it right in front of me. <laughs> they, so I'll use that example. Water puts out fire. So that's a grandparent, grandchild relationship. So there's a controlling relationship going diagonal in that circle too. So they, the organ systems are also related to each other and interplaying with that. So you can even find figure out, if you're really following five elements, where a disease process might continue to go if you know that cycle too okay you know in later stages and it's going you know that mother-child relationship we might want to start strengthening our our kidney system soon because we're going in that order it, it, it seemed to be the earth system the spleen system and then we're seeing it affect the lung system okay I'm going to start strengthening that kidney system to try to to stop that progression too and work backward that way. So there's different angles you can use with the five elements.
This was great information. We're so happy that we had you on and to be able to have somebody to talk about acupuncture and animals. And um, um, Rebecca, again, thank you so much for coming out. And if people are locally listening in the area, how can they find you? Yeah, so they um, they can find me from my website. It's um, www.cottonwoodcreekvet.com. The name of my practice is Cottonwood Creek Veterinary Services. They can also reach me by phone, um, and that is 518 518- nine five six zero five five one we also have a facebook page um, which is cottonwood creek veterinary services so you can find me there and if you want to ever email me you can also email me um, and that is rj kryzak k-r-y-z-a-k at yahoo.com so you can reach me any of those ways great well thank you so much for coming on our show thank you i had enjoyed this <laughs> If you'd like more information about our films or to purchase our DVDs, you can head on over to our website at thepastseries.com. They're also available to purchase on amazon.com. Our films are also streaming online at vimeo.com, guyamtv.com, and iTunes. If you have a show suggestion or would like us to interview someone specifically, please feel free to shoot us an email at info at thepastseries.com or send us a tweet at thepastseries. Please rate and review us in iTunes and subscribe. We hope you enjoyed the show.